My name is Soledad O'Brien, and uh, during my day job, I am a anchor and special correspondent for CNN. And on behalf of Chicago Ideas Week, I want to welcome you to our discussion, which focuses on education this afternoon. You can join the discussion, by the way, on Twitter at hashtag CIWEDU. I will not feel offended at any time if you whip out your Blackberries or your iPhones or whatever you need to do and tweet to your friends. We welcome it. Uh, this afternoon, we're going to explore some of the biggest challenges, some of the biggest problems that face our educational system in this country. Also, we want to talk about how we can identify them, and maybe most importantly, is talk about how we can change them and define academic success. So we will begin right away with our very first speaker. Sandra Day O'Connor, I'm sure, is someone you all know. She is a retired associate justice, was the first female member of the United States Supreme Court, nominated by President Reagan. She served as an associate justice from 1981 until her retirement from the court in 2006. Before her appointment, she was an elected official in Arizona. Recently, Justice O'Connor launched the iCivics Initiative, which was created to offer free civics lessons plans and interactive video games for middle and high school educators. So please join me in welcoming our first speaker, Justice O'Connor. Greetings, and thanks for the introduction, Soledad. I became interested in um, how we were doing about educating young Americans about how our government works so that they could be part of it. I became interested because two-thirds of Americans cannot name the three branches of government. Less than one-half of our citizens can name a single Supreme Court justice. And about two-thirds of Americans can name at least one judge on American Idol, <laughs> but Supreme Court, not one. Now, more than one-fourth of Americans do not know who we fought against in the Revolutionary War. Um, I think that recent um, facts of eighth graders show that less than half of them know the purpose of the Bill of Rights, and it's right there in the name. You know, that tells me. <laughs> We have a problem. We really do. And I wanted to know what could be done as an outsider to the system to help alleviate that education problem. And today, everything's by computer. I'm not computer literate, particularly. I grew up too soon for that. I do a little, but not as much as any of you. But everybody today is on computers, and we do things in that method. So after consulting with people that we brought together at Georgetown Law School to have a conference, and we tried to bring leaders from around the country to that to talk about how little Americans knew, the suggestion was we needed some kind of educational program. And how about a web-based program? We ended up, um, the people that I assembled and I, in thinking that we could create a web-based program that's interactive and put it online and maybe do some good. We focused on uh, the early grades um, up to maybe first year in high school. You may or may not know that half the states in the United States no longer make the teaching of civics and government a requirement. And the only reason we got public schools in this country, we wrote the con Constitution, set up the government, we had no public schools. And we got them with people arguing, such as Horace Mann did, that we had to have public schools in order to teach our young citizens how the government works and how they can be part of it. That's why we got them. So today, to see half the states not make civics a requirement is disturbing. And that's why we started 
the website that we have, iCivics, it's found at www.icivics.org. And we do it with games that the young people play because we also have learned that young people, the age that we're trying to reach, spend on the average 40 hours a week in front of some kind of a screen. That includes television as well as computer screens. Now, I only need about an hour, so that isn't asking too much. And that's what we've started, and I hope that each of you will take a look at the website and the games. I hope that each of you will be interested enough to contact any schools that your children attend, any schools that you know of, whether or not your children are in them, and encourage them to plug in and use it. We've kept it free. It costs nothing for the schools to use. Very teacher friendly. We meet the standards of every state that has any standards for <laughs> education. And uh, we love your help. And so I'm going to sit down so we can talk a little bit with Soledad about some of these other things. Wonderful, thank you. Open this one for you. Thanks. And open this one for me. Good. Uh, you started with some really terrible statistics. And I they think because terrible. your delivery was funny, we sort of were, you know, laughing about American Idol judges. People can tick them off and yet yep. can't actually name yep. any Supreme right. Court judges. But right. when you think about that, that's almost terrifying. What do you think has happened? I mean, why are we where we are today? Well, that's the question we're not too sure about. We're a generation of people that wants to be entertained all the time. And I'm not sure that we're a generation that wants to be educated or that insists on education of our children. What do you think? You ought to know. Well, you know, um, <laughs> you I think, that that's, I, I think that's part of it. But I think there's also another part of it that is, uh, if I had a 15-year-old sitting here, they'd say, now, why do I need to know? The name, you know, I need to know the name of the judge on American Idol if I want to, you know, later yeah. email in my my uh, my favorite contestant. Why does it matter to me that I can name the Supreme Court justices? Because you want to be well educated enough to manage to get your government, your county, your city, your state, whatever it is, to carry out the kinds of programs that you want to see carried out. Suppose you live in Chicago and you're somewhat near a park, but there's no facility there for rollerblading, let's say, and you're a rollerblader. You want to make sure that you get a facility like that. How do you go about it? Well, you need to know how your government works. You need to know how things work so you can be part of it to make it work well for you. And so we all have occasions when we want to see our government work. And I think all of us take some pride in our country and in our state and perhaps our city, and we want to see it do well. So it matters to us how it works. There are a whole bunch of Supreme Court justices who, when they retire, they just retire. <laughs> you have gone well, to tackle something I know. that's big and important and a lot of work. Why? Well, many of them die in office because you can go on. For, there's no retirement age, so you can just keep going. Not that you have to. You're going to get paid the same whether you stay or go. But you, you kind of get used to working. But I stepped down because my husband and I, we met in law school. We were married 57 years, and he passed away two years ago from Alzheimer's disease. And he had reached the stage with that disease where he needed care in a care center. I couldn't provide it individually. And at that point, I decided the best place would be if we went back to Phoenix, Arizona, where we spent so many years and where we have two of our three sons and their families so that he could be visited and cared for there. So. I thought I had to step down. That was an easy decision. He had been wonderful about my career, and it was time I did something for him. But why tackle the, I mean, you know, when people tackle education, like there are about 2,650,000 easier things to take on in retirement. Mm, I know, but I have grandchildren, and I want them That's educated. Personal. 
sure. I mean, and just my realization that if we don't educate our young people about how our government works and help them be part of it, we're giving up the country. And we don't want to do that. We have something to be proud of here. And we have to make it work better and work for and with us. Where have you seen in sort of recent history, and maybe Occupy Wall Street is an example, or maybe it's not, where you wanted to almost yell at the TV, you people could use a civics lesson, or this would really help your cause, or what you're saying. I mean, I'm curious to know if you sometimes look at debates and, and realize that people are not knowledgeable about civics that would actually help them. Well, every day. I mean, you can pick up the newspaper any day, and you can read about things happening in your community, or your state, or even the nation, where you say, gee, this is something that I'd like to say something about, or we ought to do this or that. And I don't know about you, but when I see that, I want to know how I can weigh in that might push it along and make it more likely to happen. My master tester for your site was my 10-year-old daughter, Sophia, uh, because you know she will be riveted yes. if she loves it. Yeah. And she will walk away in about eight seconds if she's bored. Right. And she loved it. And I think especially because it's very competitive. I mean, we, the yeah. way it's set up, if you guys haven't had a chance to check it out, you should just you know, Google iCivics. Very easy to find. Yeah, there are great games on it that are fun to play. That was the idea, to make them fun. Because if the young people aren't having a good time, they're going to tune it out as quickly as they can. But they're very competitive. You get yeah. to divide up money. You get to, she was yeah. trying to decide if she should be, you can be president or mm -hmm. you can be a Supreme Court justice casting the deciding vote. Like, they're kind it of. It matters. It shows all the ways that it can matter. And in fact, it's designed so that uh, if you want to compete against a class in another school in your area uh, to see who does the best on the tests on some of them, you can do that. And I know in Arizona, um, McDonald's has offered free Frosties, or whatever they call them, for the winners, <laughs> and that, that's, that's apparently a winner. So, you know, there are ways to make it work for the school. I find a real contradiction in the number of Americans who exercise their right to vote and the angry discourse about fill-in-the-blank topic. Um, you can watch it, and cable TV is guilty of it as anybody. People screaming at each other in the double box, as we like to call it, over an issue. But then when it comes to the actual using your voice mm -hmm. to cast a vote, the numbers are ridiculously bad. They're not as good as they should be. Many nations have a higher percentage of voters at the polls than we do, and it always disappoints me when I read the statistics, because we can do much better. You have a teacher segment as well. And how, yes. do you know how many schools? I mean, what's been the feedback from the teachers? Very positive. It's wonderful. But teachers are busy. And they don't have time to go out and explore what facilities are available on the web for them to use. They plan for their class. And if they don't know about something, they're not going to use it. So one of the big efforts I've had to make is how to inform schools and teachers about something that they would welcome and use if they knew about it. And that's one of my big efforts. Have you found that, I mean, it's a pretty simple site to navigate. Yes. But have you found the technology aspect of it been daunting for anyone? No. Because really, I mean, no. the way civics no. was it's last easy. taught If was, you can you know, do anything on a computer, you can do that. It's easy. But it's getting, getting it acquainted around the country and making schools and teachers aware of it. And that's, I've spent quite a bit of my time in over the last two years trying to do just that. It's free. It's free. Now, some of the states are doing really well. Um, I was just in Florida, and they have embraced this quite well. They've passed a Sandra Day O'Connor law down there to get the <laughs> schools required to use this stuff. I love it. And uh, I think a couple of other states are considering the same thing. So I'm, I'm hoping that the word is beginning to circulate. Some people might say, no one has called it civics in, I think I when know. I was in school, they hadn't even called it civics for 10 years when I was going through school. That why ultimately does it matter? I mean, I'm sure you're gonna talk about what makes a great citizen. So what is, what, what is it that makes a great citizen? Well, you have to care about what your government does. I do, don't you? I mean, I care all the way down the line. 
I live in a city and I want the city not to do stupid things and to do a certain number of things that make the streets safer and so forth. I care about what they do. And if they're not doing it well, I want to know how to speak in a way that will be heard. And the same is true at the county level and certainly at the state level. We have a few problems in Arizona right now and I've been hearing I about care about those. solving them. So I want to know how to do something that will make a difference. Is and you with young people, one thing I want to teach them that I'm worried about at present is how to disagree agreeably. We're having a lot of problems these days. We're yelling at each other when I think we would probably get further if we were agreeable with our disagreements. It does seem like the temperature and the tenor in Washington, D.C. is just at horrible levels. Yes, and at the state and local levels, too. It seems to have become the norm, and we need to turn that around. Why does civil discourse matter? I just think... I mean, is it just good, good manners, or is there something more than that? Well, I just think that's how you get things down. I ended up in Arizona uh, being in the state senate there at one point, and I was elected majority leader of the state senate. It was the first time in America that a woman had served in a legislative leadership post. Well, I had a majority of one in the senate for my party. Majority of one. So that meant any, you know, any two members of my majority could defeat anything I had, unless I got votes from the other side of the aisle. So what did I do? I would make chalupas, that's Mexican food for you who don't know, and get a bunch of cold beer and invite everybody of both parties out to my house to sit around and uh, eat Mexican food and drink beer and get acquainted, get to know each other. Now, I think that made a huge difference because if you become friends with people with whom you work, you're going to be much more apt to get things done. I worry about Congress today in Congress. Do I have enough time? Yeah, I have enough time to tell you that. The members arrive in Washington, D.C. week after week on Tuesday morning, they fly from as far away as Alaska, get there Tuesday morning. They're there Tuesday afternoon, all day Wednesday, and Thursday morning, and then they go home. That is not enough time to do anything. They may be able to attend a session or two in, their, uh, in the Senate or the House, and they may be able to go to a committee meeting or two, and maybe even sign some constituent mail but they don't have time to get to know each other. In times past, this, it didn't work that way. And they'd all stay there for two or three months and then take the big break for Christmas or something like that and come back. And in the meantime, they'd get to know each other. They might play volleyball together in the gym or swim or do something where they got to know some of their colleagues. And believe me, it makes a difference. If you have made friends with people, both in your party and across the aisle, you're going to be apt to get some work done. And I would, if I were there, I'd be proposing a law that made it a requirement that they stay there Monday through Saturday, three weeks a month, and then let them go. Your average American voter is often saying, especially if you look at sort of the ratings for our Congress people, our mm -hmm. elected officials mm -hmm. as a whole, throw the bums out. Not, they should play volleyball together. I wish they would get to know each other better. That's How do what you I change wish. that unpleasant discourse? I think we ought to talk about this problem as constituents. I think we ought to raise the issue and see if we can't get Congress to, in its own rules, make them be together longer intervals of time so they can get to know each other and do the work without yelling and screaming across the aisle, but instead work cooperatively. Is there part of iCivics that is trying to train a generation of young potential leaders to navigate that way, the Chalupa way? I don't stress the be civil part in the, in the website. I don't know if we should or not, perhaps. I'm stressing the basics there of how government works and how 
an individual citizen is part of it. That's what I'm trying to do. Is your goal to replace civics lessons and maybe in some schools that don't have them at all? Exactly. Or is it to add on to the conversations that are already happening? Both. Both. And I think it works effectively because kids like to play games. And if you make a game of it, they'll probably like it. What's the feedback you've been getting from the teachers and the feedback you've been getting from the students? And maybe even start with the students because sometimes I think if you have the students, if you have the teachers but no mm -hmm. students, you have no sight. Well, the students are more apt to say, oh, well, this is fun. You know, this is okay. Yeah, I'll do this again. This is good. I started my first, after we first got the first game on the website, I was up in Chautauqua, New York for a few days, and next door to me was this little boy, Charlie, who was about 10, and I'd met Charlie. He was there with his grandparents, and I said, Charlie, do you use a computer? Yeah, I do. I said, okay, I'm giving you this website. Now, go try it out tonight and tell me what you think. So Charlie went home, and the next day I saw him and he ran over and he said, oh, I love the website. That was a great game. He said, I was playing it until my grandma came in and mm -hmm. made me stop and go to bed. Mm -hmm. So that's what I wanted to hear. That's when I thought, okay, we might have something here. That Charlie works. on the payroll. Charlie. Um, you know, yes, you Charlie. started your talk by talking about the theory of how public, in part, how public schools were, were mm -hmm. founded, which was a sort of focus on educating kids so they could understand how their own government functions, back yes. to making yeah. good citizens. Right. Do you think a lot of what we are seeing, which I think is fair to say a crisis in education, and again, back to terrible voter numbers, are connected to this lack of understanding of the individual's power? Oh, absolutely. I mean, if you really understand that many elections are won by a tiny margin, and how important it is that people vote if they're going to make something happen, it'll connect down the line. And I think people will be much more apt to cast their vote. In conversations when people talk about school reform, or even when they talk about what a student needs to be learning, it's mm -hmm. much more mm -hmm. about, uh, well, we got to prep them for a test. Well, you know, STEM, 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 STEM. Well, reading scores are really important. Uh, almost nobody says, gee, if they would really understand the functions of the three branches of government, that would help us in the long haul. How do you battle that? I mean, isn't that kind of the big looming obstacle for you? Well, it is, but I hope that I can persuade enough people that it's important, including the education systems in the 50 states, that we can overcome that. I had civics in high school and grade school, too. I grew up on a remote ranch in Arizona and New Mexico. I had to go away to school from kindergarten on. I went to El Paso, Texas, and lived with grandparents. I got so sick and tired of learning about Stephen F. Austin. All Texas taught was Texas history. <laughs> It just drove me wild. Are there any Texans here today? <laughs> yeah. Well, maybe they've changed, but in my day it drove me crazy. <laughs> but anyway, I think we can make civics more interesting than it was for me when I was young. What did you learn and know about civics as a kid that you discovered was completely wrong when you were actually in the legislature? Oh, I don't even remember. I'm sure I didn't learn anything that affected what the legislature was doing when I was in it. But I certainly did learn in the legislature that you have to be, um, to learn how to disagree agreeably. That was number one. Because you had many issues in a legislative branch where you couldn't all agree and sometimes you felt strongly about an issue, and you were so anxious to see your side prevail that you tend to get a little too intense about it and forget that you have to be agreeable in the process. So that's an important lesson to learn and to remember in it, life as well as in the <laughs> legislature. It, many people, I think, not only are they not necessarily informed citizens, they also are fearful, I think, of the next step, which is they don't really want to serve. 
you know, and I think those they things... They don't want to serve? I don't think they want to serve. I, I think that the bar for being an elected official in an in a, in a atmosphere oh, of cameras and no, blogging and tweeting... It's a big step to serve, and I'm not advocating that everybody has to be in government. If you did, we'd be shooting each other to get into the legislature. <laughs> That's not going to happen, and it But shouldn't. I was going to say, so... But they have to be interested enough to care about for whom should I vote? Who would be the most uh, helpful uh, person to vote for in this particular election? And goodness, I look at my ballot every time, and I don't always know the people in a certain race where I have to cast a vote. And that's disturbing. You need to have some confidence that when you go in there, you're going to be able to cast the right vote. One of the worst areas is in the states that still elect their judges. And that's a bad thing to do. They, we should have a merit selection system. We're the only country in the world that still elects judges. Now, my time's up, so I'm going to It is, and I was going to ask you, the, the last question would okay. be, when do you see success? At what point do you see? Is it when someone starts manda mandating civics for children in school? Is it when we have voting numbers that are in the 70, 80 percentile? What is it? Well, for me personally, yeah. I want to see the numbers way up. I can tell you how many hits there are on, the, are on the computer any given day using my website. And I want them way up there, sky high. That will please me. The other thing is that I want to see the statistics for voting increase, that more people turn out to vote on election day than in the past. And you don't even have to go to the polls anymore. You mail it in. It's a mail-in ballot in most states. So it couldn't be easier. We have to get that up. Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, nice to have you. Okay. It's a pleasure.